Okay, welcome. Week 38 of ENM 2020 course. Um, we're deep in this discussion series. And essentially what we have is instructors getting together and discussing um, maybe key ideas or ideas that some of you have brought up. So the question for this week is essentially what's the, the feasibility and viability of this whole um, paradigm of train an ecological niche in the present and transfer it to the future to get an idea of future distribution? And interesting question. And I bet we all have pretty different perspectives on it. You know, are these predictions? Are these scenarios? Um, are they anywhere close to reality? Should we believe them? Should we invest time in them? So maybe let's start just by going around the, well, it's not around the table. Let's go around the screen and see what everybody thinks. Uh, Mona, you want to start? Sure. <laughs> um, well, I think I was reading, uh, I was reading the uh, questions and I, I mean, the, the bottom line for me is that I think these uh, projections into the future of niche models um, are useful. They are better than not knowing anything about species potential distribution in the future. But there are massive limitations that we all have to be aware of. And there are some precautions to take, for example, multiple uh, GCMs and multiple RCPs to use. Um, and yeah, just be very uh, cautious and skeptical, I guess, <laughs> of these projections in a short answer. Marlon, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I share the feelings of Mona about this. Uh, it's, I think there are a lot of limitations, not only like in the projections, but in the, in how we characterize us, how we characterize niches. So trying to project those models, which usually have limitations, generates more uncertainty. And I guess we need to be cautious, but we need to realize at some point that the information we're producing is valuable, but at, it has a limitation. So we have to be careful about interpretations. That's, that's what I think. Jorge, age before beauty, right? Pardon me? Age before beauty, so Jorge before Enrique. <laughs> yes. Uh, what I think is that uh, the kind of models that we do are basically correlations. So anytime you go beyond to, to transfer either in space or in time, you are trusting that whatever made your correlation good will remain. So what I think is, and, and I don't think we can just accept that it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. We have been doing it, but it's because we don't have anything better. What I think is that we should start doing uh, process-oriented modeling with factors, with actual mechanisms, with things happening that you understand why you got the result, the, you get the result you got. and. Um, so I think that the future is doing more process-oriented uh, modeling with, uh, with actual mechanisms, in, incorporating dispersal, incorporating interactions and stuff like that. Maybe in the future, I don't know, I wish behavior and, and plasticity, but uh, that seems to be very difficult. That's what I think. Okay, beauty. And uh, I first, I think there are uh, conceptual limitations, and also there are practical limitations. Uh, in the conceptual side is something that Jorge is mentioned, uh, but uh, this uh, approach was. Uh, 
at the beginning was was formulated for static problems where where you can find species or where are the suitable conditions for species to to, to be and when we are talking about climate change it's a dynamic process that we wouldn't have the elements to handle that unless we do what Jorge is, is suggesting that incorporating the dynamics of, of the movements of the species and, and the interaction of, and things like that. So they are very limited in that side um, so far. But uh, there are also practicalities that uh, make them uh, limited also in their, in their capabilities. And the very first one is that we don't know how, how the future would look like because the uncertainty doesn't come from, from the modeling approach. It comes from, in, in the most part, it comes from uh, the scenarios to the future. Also, there is a, a big deal of uncertainty regarding the, the way algorithms handle non-analog climates. And that's another source of, big source of uncertainty. But uh, as we didn't, we didn't know how the future is going to be, uh, we, my position is that we cannot say these are predictions. These are projections or these are scenarios. And you can, you can have many different scenarios. It's it's like the like like the GCMs or or the um, or the scenario the RCPs the the emission scenarios in which you have different likelihood for for being more likely or le or less likely, but all of them are some somewhat likely. This is exactly the case. So when we use not not a forward approach but a a, a retrospective approach, we can see the limitations of, of, of the niche models to uh, predict how species will respond in terms of their distributions. And we can see that it's, it's full of uncertainty. So I, I would say that we can use them, of course, it's the best tool we have available until now to to find out the, the trends of change, but not to, to be specific in, in terms of when and where species is going to, for example, to go extinct or, or to, to colonize some place, you know, just for the, for the big picture tendencies, I think. That was the short answer, by the way. You should see the long answer. Jesus. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, I think to me, the crucial thing is scenario versus prediction. Prediction is that you are basically saying this is the future with this level of probability. And scenario is, as Enrique said, the future could look like this or like this or like this, but it, it's not anticipating that it will be. It, it's that those are given this set of assumptions, those are the most likely uh, sets of, of future qualities. But it, it is worth saying that, you know, when, when, we, when we set out to, you know, I'll use the colloquial, predict a future distribution, um, there's this whole suite of uncertainties. And so for example, Jorge's suggestion of more mechanistic models that resolves some of them. So for example, it, it gives us a, a scenario of um, access, right? Where we bring in dispersal and we see of all of this future potential, which parts of it are more probably accessible and which parts of it are less probably accessible. And so that's, you know, that's good, but it's not, re it's not reducing the uncertainty as a whole. It's reducing the uncertainty in one dimension only or a few dimensions only. And so I think it's it's really important to, to keep this as exploration of possible futures or exploration of the major features of the future.
Jorge. There is another problem with um, when we apply our methods or any methods to climate change, we are really trying to predict the future. And we have, we may be able to calibrate models well and, and maybe have a, a way of finding what models calibrate better than others. We can do that. But uh, then you, you, you're just predicting. And so um, unless you are very sort of reckless, I think it's better to say, okay, these are the three or four scenarios, the discussion about scenarios versus prediction that we find more most likely and think about what may happen. But predict, predicting is very difficult, mainly about the future, as Jogi Berra said once. So that, that's why I think it's safer to, to make these exercises to the near future rather than go to far away to the end of the century because it doesn't make any sense of, okay, you have some questions that you would like to go beyond, but uh, doesn't make any sense to go very far away if, if you know how it will behave immediately, right? So I always advise to start with the near future and see if there is a way of not properly validating because you cannot validate the future, but to see if you have some data that can tell you that it's the right uh, direction of response of, of species to, to these scenarios. I think that near future, far future question is a funny one because, um, you know, I guess I should say we, um, Marlon being the the academically youngest of the five of us, but we've been doing these, these future projections uh, in Jorge's in my case since the late 90s, uh, Enrique right around the end of the 90s and Mona soon after that. And the two observations, one is back in that first generation of future climate projections of, of GCMs, that we were using. We were using the nearest time scenario included 2020, right. which is to say it right. included now. And what I always noticed was that the 2020 scenarios and the 2050 scenarios and the 2080 scenarios were all kind of similar, but the big difference was between present and the and first scenario. And here we are, and yeah, climates have changed, but not, not as much. And so my one caution about near versus middle versus far is that I think they're all just a reflection of future. And that's where we ought to start calling it scenario rather than prediction, because prediction, you'd tie it to, you know, by 2020 or by 2050, this will happen. Um, and then the other thing that I've noticed, and this is, this is at the level of um, somewhere like a, a nightmare or a, a dark suspicion. And I've never done the analysis and it's probably worth doing, but I, I've watched the general tendencies of my results in future climate analyses over, I think, three or four generations of uh, IPCC scenarios. And my feeling is that the ones that were based on those earliest scenarios, you know, AR2 and 3, those felt like much more extreme projections or, or uh, outcomes. And I've felt, and again, I haven't done the analysis, but I've felt that the same analysis using the more recent um, scenarios for future climate have been a little bit more nuanced and a little less extreme. And so that might be a really interesting question to ask about, you know, have our, have our models 
changed in the the extremity of their of their projections. Now that could be about the niche models that we're doing and how they transfer, you know, things like clamping. Or that could be about the climate models themselves. But it's one of those reasons why, you know, people will talk about, oh, we should be archiving these niche models because they may be used in the future. Or people talk about, well, let's put together all of the niche models that have ever been done for you know, North American mammals and let's see what their predictions show. And my answer is always and has always been, these models are pretty cheap. You know, it's not like repeating a bunch of physiological measurements or something like that. They're cheap. Why in the world would we not just repeat the models using the very best methodology that we have right now? But there's all this desire to save up these models and preserve them for future use. I don't think we should. The methods, as you guys have seen in the, you know, more than half year of this course, the methods change from month to month. So why would we, why would we want to use old models? But anyhow, if anybody's interested in a, an interesting research idea, um, you know, out there amongst the course participants, it'd be really neat to see whether climate change projections as far as outcomes for species have essentially softened through time. That's what, that's what uh, at least the opinions about emission scenarios will say, because according to revisions of like the different emission scenarios that have been proposed by the IPCC, the most current ones are less drastic, let's say, less pessimistic in terms of how how much the climate, at least how, how warmer is going to be the world. The anthropogenic emissions, mm -hmm. not the methane in, in the permafrost or things like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, I'm talking about emission scenarios regarding like the RCPPs or the new ones that I don't know how, how are they called, or the, the AC something that we had before that, the different products like from the IPCC. Yeah, there is this, this comparison between the A1, AB1, AB scenarios against the RCPs and they are not that different, of course. Yeah, except it's, that it's extreme right now. Except that the most optimistic future climate projections have basically been thrown into the garbage. You know, right. there's an R RCP 2.6, if I remember right. And when it first came out, it was taken as the the um, you know the optimistic scenario where maybe it won't be so bad. And now it's taken as the impossible scenario where it ain't going to happen much as we'd love yeah, there is even more one more optimistic in the rcps the the 1.5 degrees which is less than 2.6 but yes they, they are unlikely well as long as we keep electing idiots as presidents i won't speak uh of anybody in particular uh but as long as we elect people who uh desire to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords and things like that, you end up throwing out the optimistic climate change scenarios. It doesn't exist. It's not. It's not about scenarios. It's... So who, who amongst the five of us is still doing future climate projections? Well. I am. <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting where, you know, we have this paradigm that has liberal amounts of bullshit in it, huge assumption sets, unknown factors of variation. I'm going to put a paper on the course page about, about sorting out factors of, um, of uncertainty or producing uncertainty in future climate models. Um, and yet we're all still using it. And it's a fully informed 
use, which is, well, maybe not fully, but it's an informed use where, you know, we don't have the excuse of, oh, I saw it in the literature and, and uh, I, I thought I'd use this, this neat method. All five of us are people who have contributed to the development of this methodology. We're all fully cognizant of the known problems with it and we still use it. Because yeah, we think it still has a little bit of value. It's not complete uh, trash. <laughs> I think. I'm sorry, Bon. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to say that I think there is signal. Uh, there's there's signal in that noise. So it's not just noise. There is signal, but it's uh, what what bothers me or worries me is the um, overinterpretation of results. And so it's. Mm -hmm. I think. I think doing a study that. For example, the uh, a recent one that we did had um, pollinator uh, projections, future projections for, it was very specific for a, a single crop type, uh, the pollinators for tomatoes. And uh, we, um, we jokingly labeled out that project tomato calypse <laughs> um, because it was the pollinators for tomatoes anyways, but- um, Wouldn't it be- Tomatocalypse? I don't know. It was two foreigners trying to come up with a funny <laughs> name for the project. So. <laughs> uh, so we just had tomato and then added calypse <laughs> to the end of it. But um, so there is, there is some value. Having multiple uh, RCPs, so multiple emission scenarios and multiple GCMs give us um, at least makes me more comfortable when I, I present the possible scenarios. So I present the possible scenarios for bombus impatiens and it's, it's pretty consistent. But then I present the possible scenarios for another species and it's all over the place. So then, yeah, then for some species, it looks more useful than for, uh, for other species. What bothers me is when we see these high profile papers that you know, the title is 30% extinction of biodiversity. And it, they are based on, 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 these, on these very uncertain, very noisy uh, projections we have for many reason, reasons noisy. So I think, I think we, our responsibility when we use these um, uncertain, <laughs> uncertain research methods, uh, our responsibility is not to overstate the results. Uh, I think that's the, that's the big, for me, that's the biggest problem in the field that people run some models and then have some predictions, maps, projections, whatever you want to call them, and then just pff, go with it, so. Enrique. Uh, I think there, there is a very important problem in the field of, of climate change. And it's that we don't know, well, this is in Mexico, but I think we can say the same thing for many regions in the world, that we don't really know what's going on with climate change because we have focused so hard into future projections that we have forgotten to see what is going on right now. And in part, this is because for, for future projections, we have a lot of, of, of uh, data to, to work with. We have all the scenarios, all set beautifully by work, work claim and, and ready to go for producing models. And, and we don't have the same, the same uh, information for the recent past, for the last 50 years, for example. Until you, now. now but you have the data, you just don't, you, you, know, you in general don't use it. You have these beautifully detailed weather station data Yes, of course, but but you you need a lot of work to put it in the right way for using for modeling. Did you see that work team just this week? I think they got this historical database by decades in the last one hundred years or something like that. So things like that will will help much more to climate change science or the biology of climate change than than future projections. And uh, this is something that I'm trying to push hard here in Mexico to, to look 
backwards instead of look, looking forward or or we 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 need to look backwards to to see forward you know because if if we do not understand what's going on in terms of not only distribution but phenology for example and if we don't uh, prepare uh, like input material for asking or for answering these kind of questions like how how is phenology being affected in terms of, of uh, crops or in terms of, of, of imposition or migration or things like that. Uh, we will keep doing models for the future and basically doing science fiction until we have a better way to, to test these models, to validate these models or to prove that these models are working fine. I don't know how many how many studies there are of old studies to test if those old projections to the present in that time to the future are really working or not. Can so this is good because I was going to that was one I don't know one point I wanted to make sure that we discuss which is this the, the, the uh, difference between potential distribution and realized distribution. So what you are saying, Enrique, is, you know, what, are there studies, and there are, you know, there are studies that have, uh, have projected the potential distribution from 1950s to 2000, and then went in the field and, and, and resampled, I, I know of a study of a graduate student from Oklahoma State, um, you know, resampled the same region for, I think this was oak species, because it's a tra transition uh, zone in, in eastern Oklahoma. But the, the, the problem then becomes, well, your model generated a potential distribution, and now you're going into the field to test that potential distribution. So for trees, it's easier <laughs> because oak trees, you know, if they are not there 30 years later, unless someone cut them down, if they're not there 30 years later, it means that they die because of climate change. But, you know, you could have you could have movement that happens. You could have competition that happens. So fully grown oak trees, <laughs> they might not, there's not much that, that competes with them except again, logging. But for other species, it's, that's where I, I think it's hard to, it's hard to test even if it is, you know, forecasting from the fifties to present, the, the, uh, evaluation of that forecast from from 1950s to 2000 is difficult because we are dealing with two different you know we are dealing with different quantifications of you know potential versus realized so i don't know how to i don't know how to address that <laughs> it's complicated it, it's that's a beautiful challenge and this is a, a dissertation topic of one of my students and what we faced is that because we have different uh, data sets for for the 50s or 70s and today, only because we have different uh, number and, and distribution of points, we are doing you know forward and backwards and comparisons. There is a lot of noise because of there is a different data set. So we are we are figuring out how to 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 get around this problem. But this is very useful information. And there are very beautiful examples like the Green Elk project in, in California that they resampled those uh, sampling locations that Green Elk did in the early 90s, 1900. And, and they, with models and without models, with, with raw data. And they have found out very, very, very interesting and useful information regarding the responses of species to climate change. <clears throat> you know, also, like, despite all these limitations, this kind of research, the one that you were mentioning, Enrique, like trying to, 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 to see how, how really these predictions or projections are working, or trying to see the effects of using stable, indirect, direct variables. Uh, I think that kind of research is valuable. 
because like it gives you a better understanding of what to expect of your projection so if you're using only variables that do change with climate change uh, and if you're using variables that are stable like something related to topography or something related with soil structure uh, what's the effect of those things in your models i think when when you direct your research towards those other um kind of like questions it's it has become more valuable recently not uh because you're not saying okay this is what's going to happen but you're saying okay if you do this this is what you're going to obtain and if you do this other thing uh this is what you're going to obtain and understanding what's the difference between those things is is important we we miss you like a couple of words because you got frozen i froze Prof. Peterson is busy, but I, I'm going to say something. Yeah, bear with me for a moment, guys. I also believe that we learn by doing. So how are we going to find right. a better way if we don't try what we have? So we do it and we realize, oh my, this is a problem. We don't have the data or the model is not working well here and so on and so on. So it's by doing that we learn and we have to, to do it. But uh, taking back what Mona said, it's very important to be very careful with what we say. Uh, I also get very angry when I see those papers, 30% species are going to go extinct and you see what it's in, in, in under the hood and it's just assumption after assumption after assumption. But that is taken by the press and distributed and goes around the world. Uh, so we at least have to be careful when, what, with what we do and what we say. And, and by the way, I think we are in a community with a pension for complicating our own lives and, and, and being very careful and, 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 and worry about what kind of algorithm are we using and the differences between realized and existing and fundamental and all those things. And that kind of <clears throat> approach, I believe, is uh, more conducive to improvement and to a better getting to a better future than just uh, pouring data into a black box and cranking and getting a map, and this is the result. I, I hate to admit it, but one of my more cited papers, literally cited in the thousands of times, is a paper led by Chris Thomas. Yeah. And literally that paper was so extreme. One, it did what I just mentioned of collecting niche models from all sorts of sources and looking for patterns across all of them. And basically it was, you know, it covered thousands of species and found that X proportion of them, let's say it was 10%, um, were on their way to extinction, given the niche modeling techniques at that time. It was published in Nature. And so a few weeks later, when all the publicity was coming out, I start seeing you know, news, news uh, items in the press about um, you know, 10 million species on their way to extinction by 2050. And to be honest, it was a gross over interpretation. And it was basically just giving the news media the sort of spectacular and overhyped, um, over interpreted science that they were wanting, but that a good scientist would not do. And so I found myself giving interviews being critical of a paper on which I was a co-author. And it's just, it's not ethical. It's not, it's not science to interpret to the most spectacular with the aim of getting the most publicity. That's not appropriate. Well, many times it's not, it's not the purpose of the authors, but it's the way media 
handle the information and we we like humans like like very impressed news in general so suffice it to say in this case your uh softening of my criticism is not true which is to say it was the purpose of some of the authors yeah i was going to say that sometimes like i don't know and i, and I don't know if this is a product of this uh, requirement for scientists to publish in big journals or or things that are impactful. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of, like, I have been talking with my peers in, in the program and they're always thinking about, no, my results need to be precise, need to be true, need to be something that matters. That in, in that way I can publish in these big journals. And like this is this is the thing about science. Science is not that way. Like science, it's improving every time. Uh, some things were wrong before. Now are better. But you never know if. But you sometimes know. But you don't know all the time if what you're finding is the truth. That's the thing about biology as well. It's not, nothing. It's absolute. It's not mathematics. But so, there's a there's a fallacy in what in what you just said not not that you have fallen in the fallacy marlon but that reasoning which you are completely correct exists you know i have to have strong impactful relevant results i agree a hundred percent so that i can publish in an impactful journal i disagree and i know i know you you get that difference but people make this this logical error that for science to have impact it has to be published in a very short list of very impactful journals science nature pnas and not many more than that and that to me is a major error we we have this this term of impact which is something that what Clarivate Analytics has turned into a journal quality rating. It's basically just the number of citations per paper per year, but it invokes a fallacy. And we'll talk about this later in the course when I, when I um, give the requested units on publication, but it falls into this fallacy of because this journal has this citation rate on average, then publishing in this journal means that your research has impact. Not true. That, that, that's our problem. We are the ones that evaluate people with that kind of numbers. So it's, it's very much in our hands to correct that problem. Mm -hmm. there, there's, a, there's a million dimensions of problem with that. Uh, Jorge and I had a colleague, now deceased and departed, who had, I, th I think it was 25 science and nature papers. And you'd say, oh, cool. Must be an incredible scientist. Uh, no. The first person I told you, Marlon. He, he published on dinosaurs. And, you know, dinosaurs are a cool way to publish a, um, you know, a, 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 it's a, a cool way to get an audience for a journal that's trying to have a, a public audience as well as a, as a scientist audience. If you had been describing even cooler new species of early mammals or pterosaurs or something like that, not published in that journal. Um, but this, this, this point that Jorge makes at the University of Kansas is pretty subtle. You know, it doesn't hurt you to have published in science or nature. Uh, but you can certainly get hired or get tenure with, you know, just papers in ecology or evolution or, you know, journal biogeography or whatever. But as we look around the world, literally there are places where, and I've been told this by close colleagues, um, for tenure, you need eight papers in journals with an impact factor above one, 
and one paper with an impact factor above eight. You don't have that, forget it. You aren't it is, uh, it's a, 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 a different form of a thing that was studied since 30 or 40 years ago. It's called the diploma disease. And it's, it's a, a feature mostly of developing countries. The less developed, the more you pay attention to these things. If you are publishing in Switzerland, probably they don't care much about impact mm -hmm. factors. Right. I, I just um, reviewed three proposals for a, uh, a former, so former Soviet Republic, now independent country. And they, Name you know, facts. huh? Name names. No. Um, <laughs> they had uh, actually some very interesting proposals that were very, you know, relevant. And they were mostly uh, questions that were relevant to that part of the world. And some of the proposals went a bit farther and, and talked about general questions, but they were very merit. Well, two of the three that I read were great. But the proposal, um, the call for proposals was cast as to, you know, asking the evaluators to what degree do you believe that the results of funding this proposal will be able to be published in high impact journals? And gave a list of said high impact journals. And you know, the answer was zero. And yet I, I gave very high evaluations to those two proposals because they were very meritorious of funding. They're gonna be, you know, a, a, uh, publication on, uh, you know, cadmium pathways through ecosystems in ex former Soviet Republic. Sorry, Jorge, no names. Is not going to be published in science, but it may be published in environmental toxicology or some some journal that's very impactful, lowercase for that field. So yeah, this is this is an error that we as the scientific community makes. It's a lot like using uh, GRE scores to decide whom to admit to graduate school. You know, we have these these wonderful quantitative tests that say that um, you know that Johnny is a seven hundred and seventy, and Jeff is at six hundred twenty. And you have these beautiful num numeric scores. I had to take that damn exam 35 years ago. Um, and then recent studies have shown zero correlation between GRE scores and any measure that you would like to use of success as a graduate student and after whatever you do in graduate school. You could measure it as graduation probability, publications, uh, you know, academic rank attained, zero correlation. And so actually one thing I'm really proud about at the University of Kansas in our biology department is that uh, the admissions committee took a look at those papers and a couple months later issued a new departmental admissions policy that said, we don't pay attention to GRE scores. I was almost out of KU because of my GRE score. <laughs> I was not going to say that, but yes, I remember. <laughs> and, and in fact, there's a very clear inherent bias in those scores, which has to do with culture of origin and language of origin. Mon Mona, I don't remember your GERE scores. But I don't, don't remember. Have, you don't have to <laughs> confess them. I, I, I do remember when I took the uh, TOEFL test, the English test, and this has nothing to do with climate change projections, um, that the, I had to write an essay on baseball and I had zero understanding. Or <laughs> So talking about cultural differences, like, I don't know, baseball? What am I talking about? It was an essay on, on like, baseball and baseball players, something like that. And... <laughs> Totally not mine. <laughs> uh. So, you know, 
using these false crutches, Jorge, I know you need to take off, uh, using these false crutches of numbers, like grade point average or like impact factor, it's usually just a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. The problem is that the alternative is you have to read the papers and actually do a lot of work in yeah. order to get a feeling of how a person is, is performing. Yeah. But there's, there's at least a big movement right now towards article-based impact measures versus journal-based impact measures. So at least you can say, you know, for a given paper, what is its citation rate through time? Almost. And what is its, you know, how quick, how often is it tweeted or, uh, or something like that? So, you know, <laughs> we can certainly, that's not my hair, by the way. Come here, Kay. <laughs> we can certainly, um, we can certainly assess the impact of a paper by how it individually is used, cited, uh, whatever, versus the journal that it's in. And that I think is a positive step. Bye. <laughs> yeah, and I guess, and I guess what, what I was trying to do when I mentioned this and I deviate the conversation was to like, try to understand that based on the limitations we have with these projections, <clears throat> we cannot be certain about most of the patterns we detect in these projections and trying to add up a lot of models for a lot of the species and say how the world is gonna be in the future. It's not generally a good idea. Uh, perhaps exploring it species by species is a, is a better idea and, and some of the patterns may be like subject for a good discussion in your paper. Uh, but like, if you have to do it, you have to do it. Just try to, to see what are the good things you can say and what are the certain kind of certain things you can say, what are the ones that you cannot talk about too much in your paper. And avoid the temptation. Here's a baseball analogy for Mona, swinging for the fence, okay? You're playing baseball and you may be able to hit a base hit, you know, and get to first base or second base with a probability of, you know, 0.3 or 0.5. But you think it'd be really great if I hit a home run. And so instead of swinging to get on base and make a real contribution, you swing to try to hit that home run, which is maybe at a 0.05 probability, and you end up striking out. And you know, in science, you know, Marlon, we can do a very detailed, very rigorous analysis that is scientifically responsible, or we can swing for the fence and, and try to do the, you know, uh, pollinator extinction rates as a consequence of climate change and land use change, <laughs> and say, you know, we we looked at sixteen thousand species of bees, hummingbirds flies, this, that, and the other thing. And you know you're not go doing a good job with any of those models. So don't swing for the fence in science. Sorry, Mona. I was going to say, there is a question that is related to what we are discussing now. Since we didn't read any questions, maybe we can end in the okay. last three minutes. Um, so <laughs> what's the on question? line, on line uh, 31, 31. The question is, how to use niche modeling to predict community composition responses to climate change? And <laughs> uh, so this is, you know, we were talking about species by species models and Town, you mentioned these, these statements that pollinators, uh, 16,000 species of pollinators analyzed. I think the community uh, composition responses to climate change are even harder <laughs> to to predict with climate with uh, with um, niche modeling because because we are talking about communities we are, we have to we have to account for interactions. Town has to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean I think that's a that's a really good question. Um, 
there are some modeling approaches that are designed to look across a whole community at once. And then there is the idea of stacked distribution mm -hmm. models. And I'll admit we did not get to that in this course. Um, the two speakers that I invited to give that talk, uh, neither answered me. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, maybe Jorge would do it if we really beat on him. Um, but anyhow, it basically, you know, if you believe in the Eltonian noise hypothesis, then you can you can just use individual niche models for each of your species. If you believe that biotic interactions enter in there, then you're going to have to do something to modify your individual niche models. Um, yeah. I just want to add that this community composition, like modeling the community composition, it's like if you saw the videos from this course and you and you realize the complications that are involved for one species, like imagine for modeling a community. And and also imagine the impact of all the all the biases we have. And that it also exists for when you want to model that community. So everything complicates more. And actually, when you're trying to do community composition modeling, you generally have to reduce your area to a certain uh, extension where you have very good information mm -hmm. and certain characteristics. Now, transferability of those models is really complicated because every community is different because uh, environmental conditions change a lot in different areas and that for the future is even more complicated. That's my impression at least. Well, this also has uh, a very interesting conceptual debate, Gleason and what's uh, Clemens or what's uh, in, in community ecology the vision of, of Gleason like like overlap which is basically against uh, Clemens, right? This other vision of, of interactions. Mm -hmm. So we we should address that from the concept first and then how to implement this mm -hmm. an idea. Isn't it good that we got to this question at the in the last minute of the hour? Uh, maybe we can come back around to this. Maybe we should have a discussion about Eltonian noise yeah. and and what are communities. Maybe that would be a good one for next week. Yep, that's a good idea. It'll be hard to keep Jorge shut up. It'll be like, like it'll be like uh, Trump in a debate, right? <laughs> we start talking about that, and and in the midway we will talk about something else, like today. Exactly. That's the good thing about making this a course that is free and open. If anybody doesn't like what we're saying, they can just turn us off and they can't complain that they paid too much money for us. Anyhow, let's wrap this up. <laughs> let's wrap this up and come back next week because this is getting out of control now. Okay. Bye, guys. See you all later. Bye-bye.